Good morning and welcome to Red Hawk Reel, where we give you the scoop on what's happening at Seattle University as well as the 206. As usual, we are your hosts, Natalie Monahan and Haley Hackett. Now let's go to the top stories of the day. Have you heard about the ghosts of Chardin Hall? Well, there's a lot more than meets the eye and a lot more than ghosts that haunt this building. Tune in to a reporter, Frankie Hyatt, as she uncovers the scary truth about the ghost-friendly Seattle U building. Seattle University, home to many humans and the supernatural alike. Today, we're going to take an exclusive look into the mysterious Chardin Hall. Tiana Pridgen, former desk assistant in Chardin, tells us about her experiences in this building. There was a time I was walking after doing a lockout <clears throat> and the elevator doors opened and closed on my way there. No one was in there and it was really creepy. And just a bunch of random times I've worked, the elevators have just opened and closed on their own. Um, people say they feel weird energy when they like walk up the steps to get to their floor because, I don't know, it's just an old metal stairway. A lot of creaks. Creepy. Now, Seattle U alumni Jake Alexander will give us an exclusive look into what it was like being a resident of this building. Talking about like the culture behind it, like I'm sure people that lived there before me like talked about it, and bef like I said before I moved in, people told me like, "Oh, be careful, it's haunted," and. I've known, like, literally everyone else that has lived there has, like, said that it feels partially haunted, at least. So, yeah, it's like everyone, everyone knows and talks about it, for sure. Yeah. The only thing I really noticed, to be honest, about the ghosts in Chardon were the elevators, because they would turn on when you walked in. They would open the doors, even if no one was there to press the button. And when you got to, even if you took the stairs, when you got to the top of the stairs, they would just open up. So we kind of like, got spooked for a little bit about about that, but we kind of debunked it because we figured because a lot of old people used to live in this building, they had to have big elevators with uh, that had room for beds and stretchers so they had to have elevators that didn't have buttons and they just opened up for the beds of like sickly old people I guess. However, a lot more than ghosts haunt these halls. Before this building became Chardon, it was known as the Bessie Burton Nursing Home, where many SU nursing students actually worked. In 2007, SU bought the building and made the residents of the home find a new place to live in only two months. As you can see, there is a lot of ethical controversy surrounding this. One former SU nursing student weighs in on this issue. I was kind of sad. I was really hoping that they would keep it a nursing home so that other nursing students could learn there. But it was pretty tragic to find out they weren't. They had expressed to me how sad they were because they had made friends with other people living there. Oh, there was a protest. There was a small protest. This poorly made ethical decision will haunt Seattle University a lot more than any ghosts ever will. After a less than perfect review from the King County Health Department, is the food at Seattle University safe for students to consume? Here is Madeline McHugh with the story. Seattle University is home to over 5,000 undergrad students, half of which are obligated to spend thousands of dollars on a meal plan, as it is required of freshmen and sophomores. With their award-winning catering service, Bon Appetit, you may think these students are extremely lucky with little to complain. However, this is not the case with Seattle U's student body, who is largely dissatisfied with Bon Appetit's quality of food and service. What is different about SU's cafes, namely Cherry Street Market, and why is there a disconnect between Bon Appetit's mission and the greater opinion of the student body? With only a few cafes to eat at, students at Seattle University are restricted to the Bistro and Cherry Street Market to pay astronomical prices for their daily meals. As a catering service that has cafes and universities and museums all over the country, Bon Appetit has gotten a lot of recognition for their work at universities such as Washington University in St. Louis. This coupled with their expansive website, which lists all the ways they are working as a company to buy sustainable and ethical foods, 
makes Seattle University's food options seem like nothing but ideal. This is unfortunately not exactly the case. Despite looking good on paper, Bon Appetit's cafes on Seattle University campus, mostly C Street, do not have the same glowing reviews by students, and the students aren't alone. With the new Moji Health Safety Rating System, C Street has landed an OK, backing up claims made by students. While OK may seem just that, OK, it is not. The new food safety rating system is based on a curve, which many experts say provides consumers with the most accurate and useful information. And according to the King County Department of Health, an OK rating places you in the bottom 10% of all restaurants in the area. This rating is also based on an average of the last four inspections, meaning C Street has a history of horrible inspections. What gave them such a bad review? Mostly heating and cooling temperatures being unsatisfactory, which is one of the main causes of foodborne illnesses. Due to the problems with their food safety, I made a point to reach out to several people in management at Bon Appetit, with no luck as no one would give me an interview. Rather, I set out to interview some students while also putting out a survey, asking them about their experience with Bon Appetit and if they had any suggestions for them. Uh, specifically C Street, uh, it's been like, it's been up and down. Like there are days where sometimes the food's really good. There are other days where it's, to be honest, pretty bad. There's always like something like wrong with it, you know, like sometimes like they would, the rice would be left out for too long. It was like super dry or like they'd run out of stuff like super fast. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, it's minor things to begin with. Because especially sometimes they're like their ingredients. Mm -hmm. It's not even like the quality of the ingredients, it's how they're like prepared. It's almost like sometimes it seems like they're like just butchering food, mm -hmm. really, to be honest. What do you think the general perception then of C Street and Bon Appetit is? Uh, pretty negative. I mean there I mean we are grateful that like I said before, that our like it's a it's a better uh, like eatery than other college campuses. Right. There are just so many things that uh, that need to be improved. I think their goal, or the way they advertise it, is to provide service for a sustainable future or mm -hmm. something like that. A lot of food is sustainable, but then the, some of the food they get is uh, processed, so I don't know okay. how sustainable it really is, but yeah. I'm not going to question it. And so we always make sure that our food is never contaminated, or we never cross-contaminate with the food, so right. no one's gotten sick. Even though we got a health grade of, like, okay, mm -hmm. if we get judged now, it'll probably be, like, good or excellent. Maybe just good, because... There are some, some parts of the uh, C Street where we can't reach and are right. hard to clean and sometimes we don't, we can't see with our naked eyes so it's like hard to make sure that everything's perfect but yeah. we have room for, for improvement. Every time I handle sushi it's like always like hot, warmer than it needs to be or it's not cold enough so we have to refreeze it, mm -hmm. put it in a blaster or put it back in the fridge mm -hmm. or something's not hot enough people always put it, which doesn't really happen but, but I find it frustrating. Yeah. I think they're not varying their information well, well enough when clarifying it to their customers. I mm -hmm. think they don't understand what a lot of this stuff means. Mm -hmm. I think they need to give it out a more detailed explanation about where their food actually comes from, who's growing the food, who's baking the food, all that stuff. The students at Seattle U are dissatisfied with the food service and quality and demand more transparency, for their health may be at risk. As long as Bon Appetit stays quiet, things will not progress and their food safety will not improve. If you're a student at Seattle University, reach out to su.cafebonappetit.com and share your experiences. Hopefully, if enough people express health safety concerns, Bon Appetit will listen. This has been Maddie McHugh with Red Hawk Real. Have you ever heard of ROTC? What about Ranger Challenge? Many students at Seattle University might answer no to these questions. The award-winning program often goes unnoticed on campus compared to the athletic programs. Reporters Maggie and Maddie find out why. Seattle University is home to Division I athletes from a variety of different sports. What many students of Seattle University don't know about is its award-winning ROTC program, whose Ranger Challenge places top 10 almost every year. To find out the reason behind their lack of presence on campus, we set out to interview both athletes and cadets. First, we looked at the classroom setting to see if there was a difference in presence and better benefits between the two there. No, no. My, my experience, 
The coach uh, told us that whenever we have to leave early, like a Thursday or Friday, we were responsible for getting all the work done beforehand. So, if anything, it's kind of unspecial. Uh, me personally? hold too big a difference. Neither reported experiencing special treatment. If anything, there was a lack of acknowledgement of either program whatsoever. We then explored what their program's access to campus facilities looked like and if there were any differences there. Yeah, we get to go into the athletic facilities, which is nice. Also, the uh, rehab work is really good. We don't have access to the gym like athletes do. We um, just use the gym like regular students at Seattle U. When um, being in ROTC, you actually have to maintain a physical fitness level in order to even be in the Army. But since, since we always like, when we lift weights, we always practice in, in our weight room. It's a very like controlled environment. And we have our coaches like doing everything, or not doing anything, but coaching us. And everybody knows what to do. The days when I go into the actual gym and have to work, work out in there, it annoys the hell out of me, just being around like other people who are, who are doing like the workout that, I, that I'm doing. ROTC cadets had limited access and less to work with. Athletes received more access along with programs such as rehabilitation. We discovered this limited access and lack of presence on campus was due to minimal media coverage and advertisement. All of this leading to limited knowledge amongst students on campus of ROTC and its success. No, I can't say that if you asked a random person that they would even know what Ranger Challenge was. Um, they'd probably be lucky to know what ROTC is. Uh, to be honest, I don't know much about ROTC, so I can't comment. But the people I know in ROTC work really hard, the good students. I know they get up really early in the morning, so I never see them, and also I just never hear or see anything about them. Have you ever heard of Ranger Challenge? Nope. So Ranger Challenge is a team within ROTC that goes off and competes in the different, you know, Army Standard events with other programs in our regions. So it's kind of like, like our sport, so like, you know, it's how our school, how our program represents itself. It's how we get our name out into the other, like, hey, we have a good ROTC program. Which, we got fifth this year. Um, last year I was on the team and we got second place. So we do, we do really well um, as far as competing with the other schools. Associate Athletic Director Eric Guerrera stated, basketball, soccer, volleyball, and baseball are funded at the highest level as they are the programs we expect to generate the most media exposure, drive campus engagement, engage alumni support, and win championships. But if ROTC is winning championships of their own as well as bringing in money for the school, we have to ask, why aren't they receiving the same exposure as the athletic programs? With more and more students picking majors in STEM fields, stress levels are higher than ever. Rania Kaur investigates a multitude of factors that Seattle University students feel contribute to their success in the College in Science Engineering. Science and Engineering at Seattle University has more than a dozen majors spanning the science, technology, engineering and math STEM field with over 1,000 undergraduate and graduate students. In a report done by U.S. News in 2015, 58% of the degrees earned by men and 33% of the degrees earned by women are in the STEM fields, an upward trend since 2004. With this increase come studies like the one conducted by Hall and Spreadlake in 2016, titled Encouraging Realistic Expectations in STEM Students. It highlights the marked pressure to succeed academically, which can serve to impede student success. In a study conducted of 50 students on Seattle University campus, 72% rated their stress level five or over on a scale of one to 10. Of the 50 students, 
54% of them cited that they're stressed because the class material is too hard. Everybody can drive a car, everybody can learn, learn to program, and that's, you know, and that's worn out. You know, the, like people that say, well, I can't do this, and by the end of the quarter, they actually can, okay? Um, but I think that, you know, that there is some stress along the way. 38% claimed it was because of the amount of studying required for the classes. What I would change would be um, the amount of work required for them. Professors and department chairs in the College of Science and Engineering do recognize that they give a lot of work to students. In the past, they have tried to cut down courses if they believe it is too much and students are struggling. But in intro physics, we already throw out a whole lot of topics. Like in the calculus based series, we took out thermodynamics and made a separate course just to slow down the course and give students more time to learn the material. Um, but you still have to cover a lot of material in one year, but that's true for biology and for chemistry as well. You have to get through quite a bit, and for calculus. So we decided, okay, well, we'll, we'll take our, our normal first quarter of calculus, we'll stretch it into two quarters as a response to students who were ready conceptually for calculus but didn't have the the background in pre-calc or the the solid algebra skills that they needed to be successful on the on the standard track with the idea that we would uh, r relax the pace a little bit and anytime there was an indication that students were struggling with something that um, especially if it was something that m most people might expect to have seen in the pre-calculus class um, we have the time in that class to, to kind of stop progressing through the material and say, okay, let's take a break. There are other contributing factors to stress levels besides rigor of STEM fields. For example, those that have documented disabilities also have a tougher time in classes. In data collected by the National Science Foundation, of 24.6% of all the undergrads that had a STEM major, 23.3% had a disability. This is in line with our data of students with disabilities taken from 2011 at SU because relative to college size, the College of Nursing has the highest number of students and the College of Science and Engineering also aligns with the national numbers. Richard Okamoto, Director of Disability Services, shares his input on why STEM students may find school more challenging due to their disability. I've talked to a number of students who sometimes felt like they were imposters in that particular college because you know, they got extra time exams and those kinds of things, not, t not typical of other students. Other times they are, they just have, it just takes them longer to get through learning content. And that's, there's such a fast pace, especially in a quarter system, that that can be a challenge. And that usually raises more of their anxiety because there's a lot of content to cover, so. The STEM field, regardless, is still a popular field being chosen by undergraduates. That's saying, there is a different type of academic rigor that STEM fields have that the other fields necessarily do not. Whether it's the course load, the amount of studying, the frequency of exams, there are other underlying contributing factors to stress that we cannot disregard that affect a student's performance at Seattle University. Rania Kaur, Red Hawk Real. Do you have ADHD or are you suffering from your technology use? Haley Witt investigates how students should navigate their attention issues. In any given college classroom, there are a variety of students with different capabilities for attention. For some students, it can be a useful device for note-taking, but for others, the constant stimulation from their screens may be causing ADHD-like symptoms. The more technology that we have, the more um, ADHD-like symptoms people can develop who are not ADHD, or if you have ADHD, it can make the symptoms even worse. Educators like Eric Severson, a philosophy professor at Seattle University, have noticed a potential link between screens and attention. Severson is modifying his curriculum. I've found in class that I use a lot less PowerPoints and a lot less video clips and things like that because I, I find that they're counterproductive in terms of the kind of engagements that lead to good outcomes for students in studying philosophy. All these products and things that you're consuming, apps, you know, people are trying to make them more and more addictive for your brain. And, um, you know, we have worldwide entertainment and news in the palm of our hands. This is incredibly distractive. Our brain 
did not evolve for this level of stimulation. So how can a student tell if their limited attention span is due to ADHD or to an alternative explanation such as technology? One thing is to look around and look at your um, classmates and just see, you know, how much they, how much effort it puts, they are putting into doing their work. And if you're finding that you're needing to put a lot more effort into doing um, the same work that your classmates are doing, um, and your mind tends to, because your mind tends to wander a lot more than their minds seem to be wandering, then that might be a red flag. According to Dr. Laura Honos Webb, it is most important to get a thorough evaluation. No mental disorder should be diagnosed in 45 minutes, particularly something with like ADHD, you know, and our medical system doesn't offer people the reimbursement to get the thorough diagnosis, so people will have to pay out of pocket. But we are talking about the rest of your life and a diagnosis that um, you want to rule out alternative explanations. Overall, technology seems to be causing a multitude of issues. According to a recent study published in the Journal for Clinical Psychology Science, increased technology use may be contributing to an uptick in symptoms of depression and suicidal thoughts among teens. Advise people to use parental controls on their um, computers um, so that they don't end up going places that they shouldn't be going when they need to work. While technology cannot cause ADHD, it seems to produce some very similar ADHD-like symptoms, and we should proceed with caution. I'm Haley Witt, and this is Red Hawk Real. Is the Seattle University Class of 2019 design cohort a year behind? Will they all make it into the program in time for their senior year? Red Hawk Real reporter Anna Kaplan has the details on one of Seattle U's most unpredictable and most coveted majors. Graphic design is one of the fastest growing professions in the United States, with an expected 5% increase over the next 10 years. So it's no surprise that there are a ton of students interested in the digital design major at Seattle University. However, Seattle U wasn't prepared for this increase in interest and hasn't been able to prepare the major for the amount of students interested. Specifically, the class of 2019 has, has been hit with a series of growing pains as the department deals with the influx. Associate Professor of Digital Design at Seattle U, Alexander Mouton, has a couple of reasons to explain why graphic design is booming and therefore why the digital design major at Seattle U is so popular. Um, all of the tools that are digital in this department are mostly in the digital design program. So students who have like a background in like art work digitally in high school, um, are drawn to this major because that's where the digital stuff's yeah. at. And partly it's because um, digital design is something that both students and parents feel is potentially like sort of a practical skill mm -hmm. um, which they can learn, which will land them a job. And despite knowing that it's popular, the department and the administration haven't been keeping track of the students switching into the major once they've been admitted to Seattle U. In an email, I asked the Dean of Admissions, Malor Nielsen, for some more information on people who have applied to the major and people who are in the major currently. In her first email, she said that there, the numbers weren't growing, they were in fact declining. In fall 2015, they accepted 19 new majors, in 2016, 18 new majors, and in 2017, only 14 new majors. However, in a second email, Malor said that she spoke to a colleague from institutional research and that, in fact, the numbers were astounding on how much growth there has been internally from people switching into the major. In 2012, there were only 79 students in the major, but in almost every single year since 2012, about 10 students have joined the major, making it over a hundred students in 2016. This is the issue because in the classrooms of Hunthausen, where the majority of the digital design classes are held, there are, there's a max capacity of 22 desks. Therefore, they cannot admit more than 22 people into the major. However, now that the class of 2019 is so large, this will leave a surplus of 13 students who will not make it into the major. When students are accepted to Seattle U for digital design, students are simply digital design candidates until the end of their sophomore year, where they then apply officially to the major through a portfolio process. As long as they have completed the prerequisite classes, they are normally accepted into the major. And in the past, it, it hasn't been a problem because the major was never over capacity until 2015. Therefore, the competitiveness of the major was never advertised to the students of the class of 2019 when they were applying. Those things wouldn't particularly worry me if when I was admitted to the school they were more open 
about the competitiveness of the program. If I had known that I was going to go to a school where I might not get into the program, I wouldn't have gone to SU. I would not have gone to a private school where my credits don't transfer because design is the only thing that I've ever wanted to do. And in the case of the class of 2019, the classes have been so overfilled that they are not going to apply into the major until the end of this year, their junior year. This is also an issue because students are almost $150,000 in paying money to the university, but now only a select few of them are going to make it into the major. Almost one third of the potential candidates will not make it into the major at the end of their junior year, giving them one year to either transfer schools or switch majors at Seattle U. I asked the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences where digital design is held if he knew about this situation and he said that he didn't know, meaning that the administration has also been blindsided by the amount of people interested in the major. Now I wasn't aware of that specific yeah. situation, but that would be usually something that a, a chair would work with a program and maybe with the associate dean mm -hmm. and then if it, if it uh, got to a sort of an even more major level yeah then it would come to me, but that one didn't yeah. get to me. The fate of the class of 2019 remains uncertain as to who will get into the major and who will not, but they will find out at the end of this year and during this portfolio review process in spring quarter. However, it is certain that only about two thirds of them will be able to declare into digital design. Now it's time for a short commercial break. When we come back, we'll give you the inside scoop on Seattle's sex trafficking industry and other stories around the 206. Stick around to find out more.
just out of curiosity, are counselors trained in recognizing red flags um, or any signs of a student that may be involved in sex trafficking? Uh, no, we don't okay. see specific training around um, identifying students who are who may be involved in sex trafficking or impacted by it. Um, although you know there are more general of um, safety guidelines and procedures that we're trained on. Um, but not specific to um, sex trafficking. We were very surprised to find that Seattle Public Schools had no way of measuring a student's vulnerability for being trafficked, nor their involvement in the sex trafficking industry. Considering how young these students and victims are taken into the sex trafficking industry, it would seem that prevention would be easiest to detect at the high school or middle school level. We asked Aaron Drum what other ways people may be contributing to sex trafficking or could prevent it in their daily life. If you know anyone that is being trafficked and in need of help, have them call the National Hotline for Sex Trafficking or Unbound and Rest. Additionally, we recommend that you call your local high school and middle schools, as well as the Board of Education, to petition for more preventative measures in our district. An NFL star mocks a female reporter for asking a question during a press conference. What does this mean for women in sports media? Red Hawk Reel reporters Ali Pingalo and Emma Jensen investigate. Sports are seemingly a common denominator. Men, women, and children all come together to cheer on their teams decked out in jerseys of their favorite players. However, the commonalities of sports sometimes falter, showcasing the negative side in a media frenzy world. This came to the forefront when Carolina Panthers quarterback Cam Newton mocked Jordan Rodrigue, a female reporter, after she asked a question. It's funny to hear a female talk about routes. Like, it's funny. The media quickly responded, calling out Cam. ESPN reporter Josina Anderson explained how damaging comments like Cam's are. I know personally, obviously, what it has taken just to even be sitting in this chair right now. After the backlash, Cam soon took to social media to apologize after losing countless sponsors and fans. I sincerely apologize and hope that you can find the kindness in your heart to forgive me. Thank you. And now that the headline has come and gone, what are the realities of women like Jordan who Cam was mocking? Specifically, the realities of these women in Seattle. Q13 Fox sport reporter Michelle Letka paints a different picture working with Seattle athletes. I don't think his comments are 100% accurate of the entire sports industry at all. I'm so fortunate to work with the Seahawks where I've never had an issue like that at all. I've never had a player question my intelligence. Seattle Seahawks and Sounders reporter Jackie Montgomery also painted a more positive picture when it comes to working environments in Seattle. There's so many women that work in sports and there's so many men that support us in in our roles that I think that there's a lot more like good. Seattle Seahawks sideline reporter Jen Mueller says women play a vital part in sports. The norm is that the guys that I work with do not know what life is like without a female on the sidelines or in their locker room or on their local sports cast. One Seahawk in particular, Michael Bennett, publicly lives up to what these women are saying. In an article for The Undefeated, Michael said, I think in this generation, I think it's going to be important for us to continuously celebrate our women as they step up to different platforms, to empower young girls 
to not just be cheerleaders anymore. However, being in the Seattle market doesn't fully mean female sport reporters don't face challenges, but that doesn't stop them from proving people wrong. People have a lot of assumptions about women in sports and um, kind of beating those stereotypes, not letting yourself become a stereotype. While these women are fully qualified in their profession, they still have to deal with social media, a brutal reality for many that is only heightened in a male-dominated field. There's a lot of stupid people on the internet. <laughs> There's a lot of people that, um, you know, get all the courage in the world when they're hiding behind a keyboard. And unfortunately, women, are, I think, are attacked a lot more. This was highlighted in April of 2016 when Just Not Sports produced a video where men read tweets that female reporters received. One of the players should beat you to death with their hockey stick like the whore you are. A lot of C word. There's a lot of C in, words. In yeah. Yeah. This is why we don't hire any females unless we need, uh, unless we need our sucked or our food cooked. So what makes it all worth it? These reporters know that they can use that medium to do so much more good than the bad that comes at them. I've been given a platform that I've worked hard to get, but now that I have it, I'm not going to take it for granted and I have a platform that I can voice my opinion and people, people listen. And with that perseverance, women in sports are paving the way for those who will come after. I think that there have been a lot of women who have worked very hard to maintain their credibility and establish a reputation that helps those of us who have followed have it a little bit easier. Even with the struggles women face in this industry, they will continue to be in the conversation since sports is the ultimate unifier. Sports, they really have, it has the capability of bringing people together and to show kind of how people are able to get through adversity by using sports. And it's just kind of a common ground that I feel like across different cultures or generations. That common ground is what ultimately led a national headline into a conversation. A conversation which then showcased how powerful sports are and how powerful women can be in sports. Reporting for Red Hawk Real, this is Ali Pingello and Emma Jensen. Follow Alexis Taylor as she uncovers some surprisingly new information you may not know about the not-so-righteous Salvation Army. Tis the season in cities nationwide. Salvation Army volunteers out wearing red Santa hats and aprons are ringing bells and soliciting donation. You oftentimes might consider donating because the handful of hard-earned coins you drop means little to you but can make a substantial difference to the people you're helping. Or so we think. Plus they're braving the cold, ringing a bell, and like most of us, we just want to help out. But I couldn't help but wonder how many of us actually know where that handful of change ends up. But even more so, how accessible are the goods and services they provide for individuals in need? Here's what you might not know about the Salvation Army, and perhaps why you may want to think again before you decide to donate this holiday season. Salvation Army is a religious organization founded in 1865 by a Methodist minister, which might seem like a given considering the word salvation is its namesake. As an organization, its primary goal is to, quote, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sentiment alone is not a problem. I mean, think of all the religious charities that do the same, do some really amazing work for the people they serve. But what most donators are unaware of is when you donate to the Salvation Army, you're actually quite literally donating to a church with values that will make you surprised that you used to garner support without even thinking twice about it. I mean, after all, it seems staggering that an organization that raked in $183.7 million in donations in 2013 has what seems to be so little information about where to get aid or assistance based on individual need. Now, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that this isn't an entirely new revelation, but I wanted to concretely find out if the campaign efforts the Salvation Army puts out to appear inclusive and focused on the prosperity of the greater good are actually rooted in the same discrimination that seems to resurface every so often. The largest example that I wanted to look into was that, like many other evangelical churches, they will discriminate in hiring you, at least in certain leadership positions within the organization, if you are an LGBTQ-identifying person. 
In 2001, the Salvation Army actually requested permission from the Bush administration to override local-level laws that prevented workplace discrimination against homosexuals, even though they received taxpayer dollars for their quote-unquote charity work. Salvation Army is no stranger to anti-gay scandals. Perhaps the most infamous occurred in 2012 when Andrew Craby, media relations director for Salvation Army Australia, said gay people should be put to death. Salvation Army officials denounced the claim in the strongest possible terms, but each time a similar incident occurs, the organization goes into public relations crisis mode, arguing the individual incidents do not reflect its larger stance. I did not want to dismiss all the programs and efforts currently in place based on these instances, so I decided to head to a local Salvation Army location here in Seattle to see firsthand what exactly the side of this organization looks like. As a disclaimer and a protection of the privacy and rights of the two individuals I spoke with about their experience as opiate addicts in the adult rehabilitation program located here in Seattle, they requested they not be recorded and that their names not be disclosed. Individual A mentioned that he had checked himself out into the adult rehabilitation program here in Seattle, which is where a majority of the thrift family store's proceeds go within King County. I asked the two what key piece of information they would pass on to other addicts who are looking for information and assistance, and they both mentioned that it is misleading, but you are expected to have clean urine before you register. For individuals who need guidance and assistance in getting clean, this center won't take you. They unfortunately turn away a lot of really good people who need assistance getting clean, but don't know the first steps. He says, if you are able and in a place to provide a clean sample, that it is one of the most well-known and populous free rehab services you can find. He also mentioned that there were massive limitations in the ARC and what they were equipped to assist you with, i.e. they cannot prescribe you any prescription drugs or medical assistance, so you are getting much more of a collaborative support group than what you would expect from an actual rehab facility. I kindly thank the both of them for their time and for their insight, and after speaking with them and the research I have done for myself, I've concluded that this holiday season, if you and or your family are thinking charity, perhaps look into and invest in local level charity without religious affiliation to ensure that the services are all need-based and that no one is turned away this holiday season. I'm Alexis Taylor. Thank you. I see a mansard roof through the trees. I see a salt as Seattle's metropolitan population grows at a rapid rate, certain factions of the city are falling behind. One of those factions is Metro Transit, providing the Seattle area with buses, streetcars, and water taxis. According to census data released at the beginning of the year and analyzed by The Stranger, Seattle's metropolitan area has been increasing by around 1,000 people per day within the actual downtown Seattle area and its surrounding boroughs. Thanks to the sort of technology boom the Seattle area has become known for in the last few years, thanks to tech giants like Amazon and Microsoft. This increase in population has been hard on Seattle's housing market and is now becoming hard on its public transportation. Following the market crash of 2008 and rapid increase in population, Seattle Metro Transit has seen a steady increase in ridership, and the cost of maintaining vehicles has risen exponentially, while buses and trains have been lagging behind in reliability. The Seattle Department of Transportation, or SDOT for short, have found themselves that these increases in population and ridership have affected their service abilities, saying in their accountability findings, quote, Our findings reinforce the idea that it takes longer than before to make the same trip. Traffic congestion, especially on freeways, is worsening. According to SDOT release data, the average public transportation commute for workers is 28.5 minutes, while 3.5% of the total population have super commutes in excess of 90 minutes, including transferring buses or switching forms of transportation. What has truly been the two biggest failures of SDOT have been the Link Light Rail and the First Hill, First Ave, and South Lake Union trolleys. The Link Light Rail was built in 2009, expanding from the SeaTac Airport to Westlake in the center of downtown. It took almost seven years for the extension on, on these stops, now to include the Capitol Hill and University of Washington to the north and Ingle Lake to the south. The light rail will continue to expand north to Northgate Mall and Linwood, but these will not be complete until the early 2020s. Ridership on the link has increased 13.5% and has seen struggles with overcrowding and delays. The light rail was also built in conjunction with already existing underground bus tunnels, causing the link to have delays and having to deal with traffic, instead of being able to operate on its own individual track, like the trains of Chicago or New York. SDOT has also now thrown millions of dollars to the streetcars of Seattle, including the First Hill and South Lake Union streetcars, and now a new streetcar built along First Avenue. The First Ave streetcar has seen a lot of backlash, not only from citizens, but from city council members. 
As reported by the Seattle Times, City Council member Lisa Herbold has con- expressed concern that the new First Avenue streetcar will not meet ridership expectations and that money should be put towards expanding bus routes, saying, quote, The streetcar, from my perspective, has limited utility as a transportation infrastructure tool. We need to be evaluating our investments on how well we are helping people get to and from their day-to-day obligations. What Seattle needs in terms of public transportation is a commitment to help find ways to separate transit from the rest of the general population. SDOT said this themselves in their findings, saying, quote, Timing traffic lights, giving transit priority at intersections, building queue jumps in bus lanes, and making other minor modifications to roadways can make trips faster. Seattle's transit system has fallen behind modern needs and is still following the old ways of doing things, keeping Seattle behind. The rise in minimum wage is forcing Seattle restaurants to make major changes. However, each establishment is approaching the changes quite differently. This, could, this is how it could affect you as a customer or someone looking for employment. Here's Colin Hamilton reporting. Whether it's your favorite...
is the true cost of a balloon in Seattle? Watch Red Hawk Real reporter Emma Cooney blow the lid off the helium industry and reveal what it takes to run a small business in Seattle. Balloons. They make people laugh and others cry. At the Red Balloon Company in the heart of Capitol Hill, you see it all. This is John Gallant, owner of the Red Balloon. He opened the shop in January of 1980. He gave us a scoop on what it takes to run a small business in Seattle these days. While it seems like all fun and games, there are true monetary, environmental, and social barriers. It is no secret that Seattle is a growing city. With this growth comes rising costs and the displacement of citizens. John explains how business in the area has changed in the last decade. Yeah, one of the hardships of running a small business is that you don't have any support from the city of Seattle. He says, rent has increased, expenses have increased, crime has increased, and homelessness has increased. It is especially hard to compete with corporations like Amazon. He estimates that in the last decade, the price of helium has increased by 150 to 200 percent. Speaking of helium, there would be no balloon business without it. Another local Seattle business called Central Welding is the supplier for the Red Balloon. They deliver up to 10 canisters of helium each week to the store. Balloons are not the only use for helium. This gas is highly valuable in scientific and military fields of study. It's even used in semiconductors and lasers. The U.S. produces about 75% of the world's supply of helium, all found in the Texas Panhandle. In 1925, the U.S. government began hoarding the supply, setting up the Federal Helium Program. However, it is expected by 2020 the helium levels will decrease to dangerously low levels. More environmental worries regarding the store is the disposal of balloons. Are our balloons biodegradable? Uh, the mylars are not, unfortunately, but our latex balloons are. So all of these latex balloons will eventually decompose. John explains they're just rubber from a sap tree. But the mylar balloons and the ribbons will be left in landfills. I want to learn more about where these balloons come from. So I headed down to the MSR Wholesale, Seattle's main balloon distributor. I met the owner, Jeff, who showed me around the warehouse that is home to hundreds of thousands of balloons. A vast majority of these are not biodegradable. He explained if balloons are discontinued or bad sellers, they throw them out in bulk. When talking to Jeff, I found out a lot of the issues the red balloon faces, he faces as well. One of which includes rising rents. Eight or ten years ago, 200 bucks a square foot was Class A office space in Seattle. And now it's a frickin' warehouse in the Kent Valley. Wow. This is when I realized a threat to one small business affects so many others. If the MSR wholesale business failed, then that would affect the red balloon, which would hurt central welding. I am realizing how interconnected Seattle is. John says he has a very good relationship with other businesses in Seattle. He says that they rely on each other for support. He thinks the best part of owning a small business is being a part of the community. You live in the community, work in the community, and you really get to know people. The Red Balloon and other small businesses serve as a reminder that Seattle's charm relies on its people. Hope that doesn't burst your bubble. Well, on that note, folks, that's the end of our show. Yes, thank you so much to our sponsors and to all the journalists that help put our show together every week. We couldn't do it without you guys. Tune in next week for, for, more, for some more stories from the 206. And if you want to submit story ideas for our journalists to investigate or simply suggestions for our show, email us at redhawkreel at seattleu.edu. Thanks again for watching and have a great night.